Welcome to the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast, the show that interviews multimillionaire real estate investors and top producers in the real estate industry. If you're looking to create passive income and achieve financial freedom so that you can do what you want, whenever you want, you're in the right place. Our goal is to simplify and make real estate investing easy for you. For more information, you can find us at www.jlm.realestate. All right, everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have Alan Hammer with me today. Alan, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Good. Um, very excited to have you on. You've been in the business for over 50 years, and you're a real estate attorney, and you own a lot of real estate yourself. So I feel like you have a lot of value to bring to the audience on our show. Um, to kind of kick it off and start, can you give me and the audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, my practice is uh, mostly investment real estate, which are properties that people buy to make a return on investment. We do uh, shopping centers, office buildings, land for development, hotels, uh, industrial buildings, but our big focus is apartment houses. Uh, I was brought up in the apartment house industry. Uh, my father was an apartment house broker. Uh, his story was interesting. Uh, he trained to be a gym teacher. Uh, they let him graduate college uh, before he went into the service. Uh, he suffered a very serious injury, war injury, and was unable to be a gym teacher. And someone in the family got him an interview at a company called the Kislak Company in New Jersey, where he spent about 30 years. He left there as senior vice president or something and started his own brokerage firm. So I was brought up in the apartment house business. My father never took me to a ball game. Uh, but he did take me to lots of apartment houses. <laughs> gotcha. And um, what is your business focus on um, today in the real estate world? Do you also invest in mostly apartment housing or do you also have a lot of other asset classes? I, I have a limited amount of other kinds of properties. I operate in one industrial building, a couple of office buildings. Uh, the bulk of our holdings are all apartment houses, uh, all of which are located in a little bit in New York, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. We're throughout Eastern Pennsylvania and we're throughout the state of New Jersey. Got it, got it. Um, in your long journey as a real estate investor, what kind of got you, um, besides your father, what made you want to go into apartments? Like what upside do you see investing into apartments aside from other asset classes from your perspective? I would say the best, best direction I had was good fortune. Because as I've said to many of my friends and partners and investors, I could have got into office buildings. I could have gone into uh, hospitality uh, just by good fortune because my father was a broker and I knew a little bit about apartments. My summer jobs were working in apartment buildings and stuff. So when I was one year out of law school, I bought my first apartment house. Wow, very good cool. Fortune. And I knew a lot of bad apartments growing up and I learned a great deal uh, every summer of college in, uh, through law school, I worked in a real estate management company. So long before I bought my first building, I was operating, working in, uh, on the operation of apartment houses, uh, which was invaluable. Gotcha, gotcha. So you had experience as you were a little kid, being around apartments all the time. Uh, your father was probably always talking about it. He was in the business. So you were, you were in it since you were a little kid. Yes. Very cool. What got you into real estate law? Um, your father was a broker. What made you want to be an attorney? Uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do like many young people. Uh, I don't know when I started thinking about law school. I was a uh, mediocre student in high school, slightly less than mediocre. Uh, and in college, I discovered I could get good grades, and I did. Uh, not knowing what to do, I applied to a bunch of law schools, got accepted, and I had no idea. I thought I'd probably go into real estate. I don't think I expected to be a practicing lawyer. And uh, uh, I got a law clerkship my summer of my last year in law school. And I loved it. And uh, I never left the firm. I've been with the same firm for uh, I clerked here in 1970. Uh, and for a brief period of time, about two years, I, uh, I spent double duty. I worked in a law firm at night mostly. And I covered uh, a real estate firm in New Jersey for one of my friends. I ran a company called the Kushner Companies for about two years. Very cool. For those who are wondering, what does your day-to-day -day look like as a real estate attorney? 
Well, I'm fortunate and I understand location. So not by coincidence entirely, even though we have uh, about 75 lawyers here, my home is very close to the office. And so it's a five minute ride away. I get here a uh, fairly reasonable hour because before I come to the office, I either play tennis or exercise. Uh, I get here around nine and I work till around six. Used to work a lot more. Uh, in the old days, we used to work late nights. And uh, my day is on the telephone most of the time, uh, unless I'm reading a contract, uh, which is basically the only kind of paperwork I do. I read and nego I negotiate the contracts when clients buy a building or sell a building. You know, I read reports during the day on my own properties. I get reports on my properties daily, weekly. Um, and I talk on the phone to a lot of people every day. Got it, got it. Any advice you can give to a newer real estate investor who doesn't understand contracts uh, very well? Any red flag we should be aware of in, in order to avoid any legal issues? To avoid legal issues, it's good to have a, a, an attorney that it's nice to be represented by your friends or relatives. It's better to be represented by someone who's got an actual knowledge and understanding of the field. When we negotiate a contract, when I talk to an attorney, I know whether they understand the apartment business very quickly. Most, because of the, the, the deals that we do uh, are mostly the larger transactions, the lawyers are sophisticated people. But when we're doing smaller or local transactions, very often we'll get somebody who just doesn't know apartments. And even on some big deals, we'll get somebody who's a, uh, uh, a real estate lawyer who does lots of stuff and doesn't do too many apartments. And often they just don't understand what's important and what's not important. They want to argue about things that are, are not terribly relevant. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I feel like you got to have an understanding of the specific niche in order to be represented correctly by, by someone such as your family or your friend. I've seen it happen a lot. I negotiated a contract either Thursday or Friday uh, on a, uh, a fairly substantial deal, about a $70 million deal. And the attorney was very not, we were on the phone about 15 minutes. And, you know, it's what it took. Very knowledgeable attorney. I will go back and forth a couple more times with client comments and stuff, but people who know what they're doing are much more efficient. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, can you take us through kind of what um, you, what obstacles you, you face and go through in a multifamily real estate transaction from start to finish? Well, right now, one of the biggest obstacles are COVID and you got to be very mindful of how many tenants are not paying the rent. Well, you've had a, an eviction moratorium throughout the country and then followed up by local moratoriums in many places. You may find yourself, especially in the more modest buildings in the lower income bracket buildings where tenants have not been able to pay the rent. Once they get a little bit behind, there's no longer an incentive to pay the rent and you can find tenants haven't paid rent in a year. Not unusual. The courts are backed up. So that's that's a single most important thing you have to be mindful of right now. Uh, other times you want to need to know about the condition of your property, whether there's municipal violations, whether the property, unless it's brand new, whether whether it's got problems. Uh, environmental has been a, an issue over the years. Not so much now because we used to see a lot of asbestos. Most of it had been removed or remediated. Uh, fuel tanks. Uh, used to be uh, when I started, all the buildings were basically uh, heated by oil uh, that changed to gas. So many buildings had either oil tanks in the ground you had to be mindful of. So these are, these are things that have come up over the years. Uh, now you got to watch your interest rates. Uh, for a while, it looked like interest rates were only going to go down and are starting to go up. Uh, in my brief career, interest rates have gone down, went up, went up, went up went up, went up, came down. And then for the last 20 years, they've been in a free fall. So it's, uh, and you make mistakes going both ways. When they're coming down, if you, if you locked a, a long rate too soon, uh, you may be sorry. When they're going up, you can't lock quick enough. So it's just a, a, a lot of things. It's good to have good advisors. It's good to, to pay attention to a lot of things if you're going to if you're going to be a real estate investor, you got to understand the economy a little bit. You want to be reading, uh, well, stock market shouldn't make much of a difference in, in apartment house investing. Even that does. You want to just see where the market is going and you want to watch interest rates. Definitely. Yeah. In interest rates are definitely huge. Where do you see rates going in the next 
one to two years. I've been consistently wrong on that for the last 20 years or so. I never expected that we'd see interest rates in the three, twos, threes, that the interest you earn in the bank is point is two tenths of 1% or three tenths of 1%. Nobody, we were getting 10% on our money for uh, not so long ago, it seems. So uh, interest rates are very hard to figure, but right now it would, the, all indications are the Fed is gonna be a little tighter. Interest rates will go up, um, but everything comes down to supply and demand. There is a lot of money in our system right now. That money wants to be invested. It's going to be hard for rates to go up a real lot as long as there's an abundance of money to be invested. But all the indications are that it's going to go up. How much? Very hard to say. Yeah. Also talking about current economics, you know, in, inflation's been, you know, at 7% lately. It's been the worst it's been in a very long time. I think they said in 20 something years, right? Yeah. Um, do you see inflation cooling off or, or do you see that being a steady trend for the next, you know, foreseeable future? I'm trying to determine, giving it a lot of thought, frankly, whether the inflation we're seeing is going to be, as many of the uh, people say, short term, because so much of it is somewhat artificial. I saw a big inflation uh, after the Nixon presidency when we had price and wage controls uh, and they came off and the interest rates soared. Inflation just was crazy. Every time you went to the store, everything cost twice as much. I had money. I had a floating loan on one of my apartment buildings that I bought at 21 percent. Um, just kept going up. Uh, right now, the inflation we're seeing is there's a lot of elements uh, that are economic elements. People have been in their homes for the last two years, many cases not spending money. By not spending money, they've been accumulating money in many cases. The government uh, money that came out to so many people, some of that went in the bank. People are now getting out more, uh, spending more. And as we see, there's, there's a lot of product that's just not available now. So people are paying more. You know, when somebody tells you that the, the manufactured suggested retail price on a new car is $40,000, they say, yeah, but how much does it really cost? And then it used to be 35000 now you go and they tell you to pray the MSRP is 40. And how much is it now? Is that 35? They say, no, that's 45. And why is that? Because we don't have any cars. And why don't we have any cars? Because chips, whatever they are, uh, they need chips. They can't make the cars as quickly as they can make chips, which sounds crazy. I think chips are little, cars are big, but cars can't be made because they don't have enough chips. So there's a lot of artificial elements that are, I, I think, driving inflation right now, which hopefully will moderate somewhat. Uh, we don't know that for a fact. People have been paying crazy prices for homes because they've been trapped in many cases in small apartments, need a little room. People are working remotely. In many cases, they find that, hey, if we don't have to travel back to New York or, or Philadelphia or San Francisco or, or, or LA or, or a big city, uh, we ought to have a bigger house. So that's driven up the price of houses in a crazy amount lately. Um, Oil is a whole nother story. Oil has been going down, down, down. Uh, when I, I, it's crazy because oil was 30, 40, $50 a barrel. Now it's $80 a barrel. Uh, I remember when it was consistently 80, $90 a barrel. And that was years ago. The demand for oil, all indications are in the long term should go down. The, the government says by 2040, most of the cars are going to be electric. Electric cars are not going to burn oil. They may use natural gas to, protect, to, to create electricity, uh, but there's indications long term that oil is going to be less needed. But right now, there's a bigger demand for it. So I think so much of the inflation has been caused by, or, and, and the 7% is accurate, but it's brand new accurate. That's not a year ago. That's not six months ago. That's last month's figures. I think that there's so many artificial factors creating the inflation that we see, that I am hopeful that we're going to see some moderation of that. We're going to see more than we've seen when there was almost no one. I have a lot of apartment houses in rent control communities. New Jersey has got more rent control communities than I believe all the states combined, individual communities. So we're used to that. But I've got a lot of rent control ordinances that are tied into the consumer price index. I have buildings where the allowable increase has been 1% or less for the last three years. So, you know, it's cuts both ways a little bit. 
Yeah, I'm in San Diego and, um, you know, I own apartments. Well, actually, all of San Diego is under rent controlled. It's statewide, but um, it's 5% plus CPI, kind of like you. And um, the rent increases nowadays have been much more dramatic in our in our world than it's ever been in the last, you know, 12 months. Our ordinances that have been tied to the CPI have allowed 1% or less for the last number of years. Uh, we've got a lot of ordinances, 1%, 2%, 3% in New Jersey. And is it still at that at that number? Oh, no, it's been incredibly low. I have a lot of buildings. Oh. Uh, now, right now, with the, the new figures, it's probably gone up a little bit. But last yeah. year, we had a lot of buildings for the whole year where allowable increase was less than one. I have a lot of buildings, two and three. Uh, not unusual at all. Um, as a real estate investor, does that make you want to get out of those markets? Well, one of the things that's been good for me is I've been a New Jersey investor before I got into Pennsylvania. And we had, a, we had a great opportunity here in New Jersey. We've had an imbalance of supply and demand since the Second World War. We are the most densely populated state in the country. Uh, we are contiguous to New York. We are minutes away from New York City. And we are contiguous in, in South Jersey to Philadelphia, the sixth largest city. So it has been an imbalance of supply and demand. We have not had... We've had not had enough housing. So that's worked very, very well for us. When rent control came in, a lot of investors, especially the institutional investors and national, stayed out of New Jersey. We were the only state pretty much that had a lot of rent control in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and a lot of investors stayed out. And I was very active in the 70s and 80s in buying buildings. Uh, it worked to my advantage. And so knowledgeable about it. So I'm guessing that because of those factors, there's been a lot of appreciation in, in that market in New Jersey. We've had incredible appreciation. Yeah. Just, just beyond what you could even con conceive of. You know? We buy buildings with leverage uh, and we were we used to pay 10,000 a unit for apartments. And that's not like historical. I mean, that's doesn't seem so many years ago. And when you buy a building for $10,000 a unit, maybe you use 2,000 unit in cash. Those buildings are today worth hundreds of thousands a unit today. So your two thousand dollar investment is, you know, crazy. Yeah, um, I think that's a really important topic to to go over with with you, Alan, because I feel like a lot of investors that I work with, uh, I'm a broker myself, and a lot of people want to get out of the markets where there's rent control because you know investors are don't like having someone control what they do with their investment, but. I feel like if you're in a great market like San Diego or New Jersey, you're always going to have appreciation and a lot of wealth gain because they're in very well located markets and the supply and demand is always in the investor's favor. So I feel like the people who go to the tertiary markets and like the Midwest or like, you know, places like that, they haven't had nearly as much appreciation as markets like New Jersey or San Diego or, or LA, stuff like that. That's accurate. I mean, an old building in New Jersey sells for the price of almost a brand new building in many other markets. Uh, just a function of supply and demand. It's, it's really worked incredibly well for us. Definitely. Um, what is your investment strategy today? How, how do you look at buildings? If you are still investing, um, how do you look at the parameters on what to buy and what not to buy? I'm investing less and less as a function largely of the price of the product today. The things that I used to buy, it's very hard to buy at 250,000 unit when, when you have a building down the street, you paid 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or, you know, it's just <laughs> it's hard, number one. And yeah. the other thing that makes it hard, um, when you're figuring out what your income and expenses, you're looking at your expenses. I have not seen any investors calculate how much it costs to replace the elevator in a building. Uh, the first 40 years I was in the business, I never replaced an elevator. My father was in the business. He was an investor as well. I don't think he ever replaced one era elevator because they last a real long time. I have a lot of old elevators. I probably replaced six, seven in the last three, four years. Every time you invest, you do an elevator, it's between two fifty dollars and $400,000. Um, you don't have room for that in your numbers, especially in such a competitive time. So things like that, because... I've done so many elevators. I have replaced boilers in every single building I own. Typical investor, when he's figuring the income and expense, figuring out the income and expenses, not figuring, you know, what's the life of the boiler? Will I have to replace it? Well, I've had to replace every single boiler I had. 
Uh, my roofs, you know, I'm a long-term investor. I'm a buy and hold. I don't sell much. Uh, I hardly ever sell anything. Uh, a roof it used to be they had a 20 year life. Now they have a 30 year life, 40 year life, depending on how much, how, how good your, sh your, your shingle material is. Um, I didn't use to figure a roof when I bought a building, but I, I take a look at a roof. I can tell you, I need a roof, you know, now two years, five years, 10 years. And if I'm not sure, my roofer tells, calls me on the phone and says, Alan, you need a roof in three years. So these are all things that make it harder for the, the experienced investor. What you'll often find is, uh, you got more younger people than older people buying apartment houses right now. It's true. Yeah. It's very true. Um, yeah, I feel like a lot of the people who are buying today aren't looking at the expenses like you are. I feel like they're looking at the best case scenario. And I, and I always tell people, you got to look at the repairs and maintenance, what structural issues the building has, you know, is the roof at the end of its life? You know, how's the main line for the plumbing? Is that, you know, the cast iron or ABS? It's cast iron. You got to really... Cast iron is killing us. Yeah. Still, for still sure. I have so many risers that are being replaced in my old buildings. I have a lot of buildings built in the 20s. Uh, yeah. The apartments, apartment industry is very simple. There were very few apartments till the turn of the last century. Uh, and in the 20s, when there was money in the system, people built a lot of buildings in the 20s, especially around the time of the Depression, 1926, 27, 28, 29. A lot of buildings, a lot of grand buildings got built then. Uh, after the Depression, there was very little built in the 30s. However, the garden apartment was invented in the 30s, and they started to build those. Anything built in the 30s was better quality because there was plenty of materials because nobody was building anything because of the Depression, and there was very cheap labor. So things in the 30s, there wasn't much built, but it's good quality. Then you get into the 40s, uh, and we were doing a lot of war preparation for our European allies before we got in even. Uh, so there weren't a lot, wasn't a lot of building going on in this country, but there was a handful, a relative handful of buildings built in the early 40s, and they're usually pretty good quality for the reasons I expressed. Uh, in 1947, 48, 49, there was a program. We had a dramatic need to, to bring the house, to build housing for the returning service people, and they built a lot of apartments, often in very good locations. So there were a lot of things built in 1947, 48, 49. And then things evened out in 50s, 60s, 70s, things got built. But in New Jersey here, for example, we have a lot of old product. We have a lot of stuff that was built in the 20s. And we have a lot of things that were built in the late 40s. Inferior construction, put it up in a hurry to get these guys. They needed apartments. They needed a place to live. They're getting, they just came home. They're getting married, having kids. So I have a lot of things built in the 40s. And I have a lot of things built in the 20s. I have a couple of things built in the 30s, a couple of things built in the 40s, but that stuff costs a lot to maintain. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, kind of closing out the podcast here, Alan, is there is there any advice you can give to a newer real estate investor who's looking to get into the business today? Yes, find a broker that you, that you get along with, spend some time with that broker. Invest time in the broker and they'll be good to you because they know their business, they know what's out there. Uh, have yourself if not a team, qualified professionals to assist you in what you're doing. And when you're investing money, be careful who your investors are if you have investors. Uh, you want to have people have confidence in you, uh, people you know, don't just take anybody's money because they may not appreciate if things aren't working out perfectly and they often don't work out perfectly. It's very good advice. Thank you, Alan. Um, if people want to go learn more about you, how can they do so? Uh, I guess if you Google me, Alan Hammer, H-A-M-M-E-R, I'm in a New Jersey attorney, it'll bring you to my law firm, which is Brock Eichler. Uh, and if you, uh, you then look at the people at Brock Eichler, you can read about me, and, you know, my various, what I've done, and where I am. Amazing. Well, thank you for your time today, Alan. Uh, you're a pleasure to interview and uh, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. Nice talking to you. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. We'll see you. Thank you for joining us on the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast the show that interviews multimillionaire real estate investors and top producers in the real estate industry. We're here to help you create passive income and achieve financial freedom so that you can do what you want, whenever you want. We'll catch you next time on The Multifamily Millionaire.